she is someone I know quite well. I'll let her share the story if she would like to. On the go first. On the go first. Um, I'd like to introduce Miss Audra Beasley. Audra um, is a parent advocate, and her husband Ty, who's hiding in the back, who is also a uh, parent advocate. So. I'm going to share a little bit about her story. I'm just going to tell you that this woman is moving mountains not only in Oklahoma but nationally too. So she's quite amazing. We wish she didn't always into it. And I'm very tall too, so. Um, yeah, I got this. So, what does equal access and participation mean? one of the issues addressed in the ADA. And uh, I met Elisa, uh, she was Maxwell's physical therapist and he started seeing her when he was about 18 months old, so 19 months old. But Max was born with spina bifida, hydrocephalus and RMPR malformation. Oh, you did show them to me? I showed the videos. Okay, so everybody knows what spine, every, all that is, okay. So his born with spinal cord injury and his, his missing a huge portion of his S2 vertebrae. And he was born with a mylial meningocele, like a big cyst on his back, and it caused a lot of spinal cord injury uh, to his L2 or L4 vertebrae. So his bowels, bladders, uh, bladders, he only has one. <laughs> uh, it all affected that. So um, he takes medication that he has to be catheterized every 34 hours for social continence. And <clears throat> I want you to think of your 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 uh, the building and, and uh, the city you live in. So if you live in Oklahoma City, I want you to think of the building that you'd like to go to. Uh, who who else who lives outside of Oklahoma City? Okay, where do you live? More. More. Okay, and hi Tulsa. I want you all to think about the building in Tulsa. <clears throat> And I'm going to ask you all a question later. But anyway, uh, over here at the Children's Hospital, my husband and I serve on the Family Advisory Council there. On the, uh, we've been there since the beginning. But it was in that hospital that I realized that Max would have restroom access, that he would eventually outgrow the baby changing station. He weighs 92 pounds and is seven, seven uh, years old. So um, I brought that issue to the hospital, and that started a chain of events. I got. You know, she spoke about the Sooner Start. I served on, I had a Governor Mary Fallon appointed me to serve on the board for the Interagency Coordinating Council. So, um, my background is a paralegal, and uh, in college I studied political science. And I'm the one that sits down and reads the dissenting opinions of the United States Supreme Court because it's fun. <laughs> but anyway, I was thrown into this, um, world where I needed to educate myself on what IDEA and the ADA and what 504, all these federal laws that protected my child um, from discrimination. And so, I don't know if you've heard of Max's Law, but Max's Law was introduced in the uh, 2020 legislative session. And it struggled for four years, and um, we are no longer pursuing the legislative branch for change. And in Oklahoma, it is now in the judicial branches the judicial branch of government as I filed a complaint and a charge against the state of Oklahoma. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about what this means. <clears throat> Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Oh, it did this last time. Why is it doing this? No, I don't want it. Whoop. Why does it do that? It, it goes on. Well, I can't talk that fast. <laughs> Why'd it go like that, y'all? Anyway, so that's Max at the Oklahoma State Capitol. But anyway, we're gonna slow this down a minute. <laughs> down a minute. There we go. I think you should just have to. Oh no! So I'll tell you a little bit about me, uh, which I did a little bit <laughs> about Max. We already talked about Max too. So uh, uh, anyway, so there's. There's all these branches of government. We've got uh, the legislative branch, we've got the judicial branch, and we've got the executive branch, right? And in Oklahoma, the, um, I think we just need to stop and I need to go on click mode. That's what I thought I did. Oh, that is. Oh, we did it! Teamwork makes yeah. it work. 
So this is my favorite quote, and a quote that we've adopted for our foundation. <clears throat> but sometimes uncomfortable conversations need to be had for great change in society. Um, this is Max. This was Mother's Day over here at the Oklahoma Children's Hospital. And this was how big he was when I realized that he was not going to have restroom access one day. Uh, that baby changing station was off the wall, and whether it fell off the wall, I don't know. They took it down to replace it. But just seeing that there uh, gave me a thought that has uh, never left me. But where will Max have restroom access when he outgrows the baby changing station? And did you know that baby changing stations are not part of Oklahoma City's building code? They are not a requirement. We're going to fix that. <clears throat> this was Max at 49 pounds on a baby changing station. See these derotation cables? Those are from Miss Elisa. <laughs> so, um, uh, we worked really hard to get the attention of a lot of people in this state that um, disabled Americans need updated building standards to include them. Whenever we build a brand new building, when we erect a building, a Title II building is a building that you and I fund with our tax dollars. Okay, you're, you, and I fought, you and I fought for, paid for, and managed this building right here. It's our building. And I had several people in that building tell me that this table covered in duct tape was equal access in, to a restroom. And we had to have a key to get in there. You, when you go to the Oklahoma State Capitol, we spent $288 million on that building to renovate it. <clears throat> Do any of y'all have to go to an armed Oklahoma Highway Patrolman and ask for a key to a clinic with a table covered in duct tape? Isn't that shameful? Y'all can ask Senator Greg Tree about that. And I've named him in a charge against the state of Oklahoma. That's disability discrimination, isn't it? So no qualified individual with a disability shall by reason of such disability be excluded from participation in or be it denied the benefits of services, programs, or activities of a public entity. And me as a caregiver, if Elisa and I were to take Max to the Capitol a couple, of, a couple of years ago, I would be directed to the floor as a caregiver, but Elisa would not be. Is that equal and access participation for me as a caregiver? And nowhere in the federal laws will you see that that issue is addressed. But we're going to address it. So this is at Integra's Hospital. This is Connor and his mama. Brenda Goolsby is a real good friend of mine. And that's a bathroom at Integra's Baptist Hospital. Should Connor have access to a restroom? What does that look like? What does equal access and participation look like? Is that, is that space held in an accessible stall meant for a disabled American and their caregiver to be down on the floor? And would any of you all be down on the floor like that? Would you ever ask somebody to be? So, the state of Oklahoma paid a local attorney and their firm about $25,000 to address this, uh, to address access issues at our Oklahoma State Capitol. And how much of that money paid to a law firm to fight Maxwell Beasley's restroom access at the Oklahoma State Capitol, I don't know, but there are certain people in elected positions in our state that hired an attorney to fight that table. We could have been the first up state capital in the nation to have an adult size changing table in our capital, and we have people in our state fighting it, but now we're the third. We're the third because other people saw that it was, no, it was not an, an issue of, of advocacy and more of an issue of demanding that the federal rights of disabled Americans be recognized in all Title II and three buildings. So we have the Babies Act of 2016, uh, Obama signed it in. And it basically states that all federal buildings owned and operated by the General Service Administration, so we have all these buildings the United States owns, the General Service Administration governs them, fixes toilets and repairs walls, right? 
Every building that the General Service Administration services is required to have a baby changing station. Do you think that Congress forgot about those weighing 51 pounds or more needing to having toileting needs? So I filed a complaint with the General Service Administration on the Holloway Building, which is the federal building downtown, and I have a General Service Administration. It will be the first federal building with, the, with an adult size changing table in Oklahoma. We have service animal relief areas at our airports. I went out to Karen Carney and talked to Karen Carney at the Will Rogers World Airport. Will Rogers World Airport was the 13th airport in the United States to put an adult size changing table. <clears throat> And they have service animal relief areas in our federal regulations that require disabled Americans who travel with a service animal, that that service animal have a restroom in our buildings. But we do not have federal explicit federal regulations that state that disabled Americans should have equal access and participation at an airport. So we have service animal relief areas that uh, people directing me and uh, Max and Max and whoever he's with to the floor. So I have addressed the U.S. Access Board regarding um, a change to the ADA's building standards, the ADA's standards for accessible design. So Science Museum Oklahoma, they are amazing. Anybody go to the Science Museum? Did you know that the Science Museum of Oklahoma is for everyone? They were the first people to install that, that little table right there he's sitting on. Within just a couple of months, their um, director of guest services um, put that table on there for Max, and then at the height of COVID, she called me and said, the museum isn't open, Science Museum is not open, but when it opens, Max has access. And it was a freestanding table. Thanks to a nonprofit, they donated this high adjustable table, and it was the first high adjustable changing table in the museum in the museum in the state of Oklahoma. There we are, me and Ty aren't we cute? Oh my god, we're so cute. <laughs> this is the Family Advisor Council. We're missing a few members, but the, this was the we are the original OG Family Advisory Council in this picture. And these people, along with a, a lot of leadership at, at the Oklahoma Children's Hospital over here. John Hayes, uh, we were the, we brought the very first adult size changing table to a state owned building in Oklahoma. And look, and you can find it on, um, the wayfinding is important too, right? Where do you think Max was changed? Where do you think Max was changed in the children's hospital before that was installed? I was directed to a bench out in their waiting room to cap him. And as I was doing so, I realized how inappropriate that was especially how inappropriate it would be when he's seven or 13. And when is it inappropriate to direct anyone to have their pants off around other people? So the Oklahoma History Center, Dan Provo, Trey Thompson. Trey Thompson was the Capital Restoration Project Manager of the, uh, the Capitol. And I have an email from him in 2019 that, yeah, we need one of these in the Capitol. And there's people in that building that fought it. But anyway, Trey Thompson is over the Oklahoma Historical Society. Dan Provo over the Oklahoma Historical Art History Center. And it was the second table installed in a museum. Look at that. Even got a little tiny potty for little tiny people. <laughs> and a little, look at this. See this over here? Like a bench. Yeah, you pull it down, then short people can get up there. Hmm. So this is a, this is an image of uh, Scissor Tail Park. Uh, we are getting we are going to get a uh, we're going to get a, a cement. So we're going to figure something out here. I don't know if it's going to be a, a, a pull down table. I, I, I really hope that they go ahead and go with the cement bench. But my next project after all this is done is we're going to write a code and also hopefully federal legislation that all of our parks, national park services. Whenever we go to, we'll talk about the national issue here in just a minute, but. I believe every single family restroom in a, in, a, in a park, a bathroom pavilion, should have a cement bench like this. They're indestructible. People do weird things to city parks. They break mirrors, they go in, 
But if we can build a park to this magnitude, we can we can provide restroom access. This is over at Ruby Grant Park, Park, Park in Norman. Who's from Norman? You, you, Ruby Grant Park? Mm -hmm. Every, this is a picture of one of their, their bathroom pavilions. It's the most inclusive park in the state. And there's not one barrier I've ever found out at that park. This is out at the airport. See this? This is a service animal relief area where they go in their dogs, uh, service animal relief areas have a place to, you know, they travel, they, you can't go past, I, mean, I see the need, there's a total need there. <clears throat> and this is what they, the 13th universal adult size changing table looks like. And it's not in a bathroom, it's in a room that used to be a nursing mother's room. There's not a sink in there. But that is what's called a temporary accommodation until a permanent plan can be put in place. Okay. First day that the Oklahoma City Convention Center opened, that was a pretty expensive building too, at 280 or 88 million dollars. But uh, I was on the phone with Tom Anderson, special projects manager, because someone had directed my son out of the floor. So they had a barrier to access the first day it opened. But they knew it was going to open like that too, because I made it very clear that we needed updated building standards. But Keith Wilkinson, this guy, ADA coordinator, he went to work. And Oklahoma City has, is on its path to have more changing tables in our city than any other city in the nation. This is what was installed at the Oklahoma City Convention Center. It's the same one that's at the First Americans Museum. Our church installed it, Southern Hills United Methodist. So there's one other one I can't think of right now. So this right here, this is found at Oklahoma City Community College. They were the first college in the state to put one in. I ran for city council, and I was invited to a, um, a, a South Side Showdown, is what they call, call it, but uh, uh, I said, well, I'd like my son to come, and where would my son have, have that restroom access? And so what they had to do is that the Health Science Center had beds, medical beds, and they pushed a medical bed into my dressing room, and within a day, that was considered temporary accommodations. This right here, they still need to put in a, a curtain so they have privacy, but you've got a men and women's restroom, no family restroom available, but if a simple table put on the wall with a curtain has enough privacy and that is accommodating. You are, you are inviting everyone to your facility and everyone it means equal access and participation. This right here is at the Civic Center. This is at the First American Museum. And did you know J.D. McCarty Center? The J.D. McCarty Center did not have a table until just recently. Because some, I went and did, spoke at uh, Bethany Children's Rehabilitation Hospital, and one of one of it could be one of you all. They carried that conversation forward to where they worked, and within about nine months, they had that table installed. So I have a really exciting, uh, um, huge leap. So. We have the International Code Council. So whenever you travel from Oklahoma over to, let's say, Canada or Germany or wherever, you, you, we have expectations of what things look like, where we go, traffic sign, all these things, right? So the International Code Council has decided that universal adult size changing tables are a necessity and have included them and have proved them for their 2024 session. So this all came about about two and a half years ago, and an advocate up in the, on the, in, in the east somewhere, I forget what state she's from, but she went before the ICC, and I took those to the Oklahoma City Building Code Commission, and they, it was passed unanimously and it's headed to the city council, probably, I would say, we, I, I believe that we'll be voting on it probably around January. But Oklahoma City, of all places, will adopt what the International Code Council is going to adopt before they adopt it, we will be the first person in the world. That's kind of cool. Be the first in the world, Oklahoma City. For something good. And there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that carry a lot of pride in that. So when we build, if we build a big new arena, if we go and we remodel the, the downtown library, which is getting a table too, um, they have it removed the barrier and, you know. So another thing you have to consider is like electrical outlets, the 
the space, wayfinding, where, okay, so you put a table in here. Have y'all ever been over to this uh, special needs restroom over here with that red table in there? Have you ever noticed it in there? If you haven't gone over to this, it's called the special needs restroom, which I don't know, the accessible restroom. <laughs> but uh, that goes back to the way we talk, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, pop over there. So the men's restroom's on this side, the women's restroom's over on that side. Right by the women's restroom is the special needs restroom. Just poke your head in there, and I want you to try to imagine why that table's there. I believe it was put there for a gentleman. Do you, you know Chuck? I do. Yep. So that was an accommodation for someone's employment. Okay? So when we build a big, nice building like this, we will decide, we, we decide as a, as a city who we adopt or who we elect, right? To, to have our voice on city councils our voice in our legislature, our voice in Congress. So I'm hoping that we're going to have unanimous support for an Oklahoma City built for all, which I think we have it. Is Max any cute? He's adorable. He's adorable. So we, we, Ty and I have worked really hard since 2019 on this, when we learned this early 2019, we, we realized that Max wouldn't have access. And we did what everyone else would do. We started having conversations about it, right? Um, just so happened we took it to our lawmakers. And although that brought a lot of awareness to the issue, it did not help anything. Because some people decided that restroom access of a disabled Americans was a partisan issue. Is your restroom access a, a, a partisan issue? No. No. And then I filed an ADA grievance. And anyway, I got sideways with a few lawmakers, I think, just for being so persistent. And so now what I've done is I've had to file a charge. I filed a charge with the state of Oklahoma, and I had a chart and a, a complaint filed against the Oklahoma State Department of Education's building for them refusing to make accommodations. And we have all this city work. And then my husband and I, we really like parks, and we like national parks. So when we went to the uh, First one with Yellowstone, we had National Park Rangers direct us to the floor with Max. And from there, you know, Mount Rushmore, we were expected to change Max on a counter in a women's restroom right by the hand dryer. So, at what point is it inappropriate to have a naked child in, in front of other people you don't know? I mean, it might be appropriate. I don't even know if it's appropriate when they're babies. But changing, when you look at a changing ta table, this is out in the open, right? You've got your naked kid out in front of all these people. So I've, I've, I've de I'm demanding people come around tables and have a talk about this. Because it directly affects us and it could affect any of us in this room. Like, you know, draw, draw, what, draw a straw, you could be diagnosed with MS, or you could have a stroke that limits your bowel and bladder functions, or you could have. Uh, your first baby and have to have urinary incontinence because that kid wrote on your bladder for months, whatever, right? We're normalizing needs, right? So is there any questions from Tulsa? I want you, you guys, have you guys thought of some really cool buildings up in Tulsa? Name a building. We talked about the DOK Center and the Williams Tower downtown. Neither building have restroom access for Max. Mm -hmm. What about the Arcology? What? Schusterman Center. What do you think? The Schusterman Center. No. The Schusterman Center. No. Nope. It doesn't? I don't think so. Nothing else about that. What is that uh, big park at the Gathering. The gathering place? Yeah. The gathering place has restroom access for all. They have temporary accommodations in place. They do not have a high adjustable table. The Tulsa International Airport was the second airport in the state of Oklahoma to install a, a, a table, but it is behind security. So if you were to go to visit there and drop somebody off, you, you, you are not allowed to. But you are only allowed to get to that table in the event you have a ticket until their policy changes. Is that equal access and participation? No. Would anyone like in Tulsa like to advocate for equal access and participation at the Tulsa International Airport and just take a phone call? What about 
What about another building? What about one in um, Moore, Norman? Big building. The Lloyd Neville Center does not have restroom access for Max. Can you believe that? We had to change him on the floor in the office in that building. Conference room. In a conference room. Mm -hmm. How about Memorial Stadium? No, nope. Memorial Stadium, Stadium does not have restroom access for Max. Sorry, why did you guys say you helped him? What about the new central library? No. Does the office ever do? I don't know the pops and pop with that pop culture museum. I think they were supposed to have one. I thought they were working on it. They were working on it. I've heard I haven't heard that it's been installed or <clears throat> name one couple big buildings in Oklahoma City that you would expect to have restroom access for all. The Devon Tower. That is not that is not a Title II or three building, that is a privately funded building. But should the Devon Tower have access? Any built after the ordinance goes through, any big building like that, if it's required, to, if it has more than six stalls, which triggers the family restroom, it will be required to. But I bet you if I contacted Devon Energy that they would put one in that building if they had space because they, they, they are very um, inclusive in things. So DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, what is equal access? All these conversations are really important. So when you hear about DEI, belonging, it, it, it really requires all of us to like think differently. So when you go out and you become an amazing superstar like Miss Elisa over here, in the first place that uh, Max had therapy, Max was changed on a uh, on just a play mat. What are those called? A mat. A mat. Yeah. A mat, a clear room on a mat where I could walk my kid down. But that's not a restroom, is it? But they accommodated his needs, helped, you know, gave me a, a, a padded floor that I could clean before and after, and then walked off the rooms, right? And shut the door so other yes. patrons could not. And then the ta a, a height and created a standing table. So if you go to work, one of the main issues I would like, I would like you to have this conversation but then carry it forward so when you go places that you be an advocate just for the need. That where are where are our patients that require caregiver assistance with their toileting needs? Where are those met in this facility? And are we servicing a whole population and do all of them have equal access to the programs and services in this building? You gotta carry that conversation forward because we're fighting ableism. Has anyone heard of ableism before today? Anybody not heard of ableism? We are we live in a world that is not created for people like Max. And it's we are create we have man-made barriers that we are throwing up and we need to start looking at those barriers and removing them. Does anyone have any questions for me? I have a question. Um, so when we go to like most of us will probably go to an outpatient clinic or rotation of some sort, how can we advocate in a location that might be a smaller setting that still sees uh, patients or caretakers who fit that description? You walk around, when you get into a, a job, just like the girl at the at J.D. McCarty Center, uh, young woman, I shouldn't say girl, I'm going to back it up anyway, she took, she went from a very similar situation here where we were having a conversation and took it back, and this right here is a table in a, in a family restroom that she found after she took the conversation back to work with her, right? So, but even before you see the need, because <coughs> you're, one day, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that this issue affects, especially when you're looking at physical therapy. If you're working with neuro, what is your class? Neuro neuropeds, right? You're dealing with CP. You're dealing with uh, hydrocephalus. You're Dealing with all kinds of um, all kinds, right? Have the conversation and then go look. So not only bring the problem before people, but also try to find a solution. Like say, hey, I noticed this restroom over here is big enough for an adult-sized changing table. Why don't we have one? They're twenty-eight hundred dollars. This one right here at the First American Museum. You can't see it very well. But it's the same one that the Oklahoma City Convention Center installed and our church installed. 
$2,800 and plug it in. Okay, that one over there on the bottom, that's at the Civic Center. That's more of like the Cadillac of them all. The more expensive, nice, you know. But they, the one in, at the First American Museum does the job. It goes up and down. And why is it important for it to go up and down? Who's really who's really short stature in here besides my husband? He might need to come up here. He weighs 92 pounds. So he transfers over from his wheelchair. He transfers over, right, at his height. I lay, I, I, we lower it down to his height. And then look how tall I am. I've got a 36 inch inseam. I got I'm all legs, right? And so for me, comfortably, I have to wrangle his shoes, AFOs, SMOs, sometimes. For a long time, derotation behavior. Oh, sorry, jeans, <laughs> a diaper, then a catheter, then a new diaper, then the jeans, then the SMOs, then the AFOs, then the derotation cables, then the shoes, or whatever. That's a lot, right? And could you imagine doing all that on the floor in the bathroom? So up here, you know, I'm doing all I need to do, wrangling him, flipping him around, <laughs> and then he gets it. The handheld device is best. See that little handheld thing in this, this right here? At this, uh, the remote. So he can transfer from his wheelchair. He's, he's, he can, he can, he doesn't stand. He kind of just, he can, he can weigh bear a little bit. Yes. He can weigh bear a little bit, but he can transfer from his wheelchair over to a table. Then he can push himself up until I can say, okay, that's good. So he has control over that table. And that's why I advocate for the handheld remote. But anyway. Have the conversation. Can I, can I add to Carson's question? Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is sometimes it's hard to get people on board. Um, a good example is that one of the facilities I won't mention that was actually one of the very first to put in the table when the slider brought it up. A group of us had been advocating as employees there for years that we need to put okay. an adult size changing table. And she mentioned it, and I said, "No, bring it up to them because." Oh, I can not tell. I can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. That, so sometimes we have to empower parents, but also helping find reasonable solutions. Like at Sensational Kids, we knew it was an issue, but us putting in there was no room to put in a table like that. So working with the owners and how. So if you're in one of these little outpatient clinics, you know, okay. So how could where? Where could we, how could we accommodate this? Just even for just a little bit, so when we expand, we know we've got to be thinking about that in the future. But then also advocating, telling our parents, helping them learn how to advocate for themselves. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, unfortunately, they don't want to listen to the therapist. But when a mama comes in there, oh boy, don't listen to mamas and daddies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was all I was going to add to that. And I, sometimes it just is a, a attitudinal barriers. So we're fighting architectural barriers, and attitudinal barriers are the most difficult because some people are unaware of their own bias. So we all have unintentional biases that we fight, right? Whether it's what your family raised you as, or the experiences you've had in life, whatever. We it this issue demands that we all. Recognize ableism. Look at our, our, our the biases that we carry with us, even though we might not be aware of it as we do and say things. Right? What kept that building from having? Oh, here we go. <laughs> what kept this certain building from having a table was an attitudinal barrier of its CEO. <laughs> yeah, but that place got a new CEO, and the issue was corrected very quickly. Any other questions? Think about all the, think about all the, who has an adult, who has a loved one in a nursing home? Does your, does your loved one ever leave the nursing home? My grandma had Parkinson's disease and she didn't leave the nursing home either. And I think that if we had a society built for people who required a wheelchair and diapering needs, that maybe I could have taken my grandma to the Civic Center for a show, or to the First American Museum, which it wasn't around that time. We all belong. And whatever our ability is, whether it's a cognitive, uh, intellectual disability, 
on developmental disability, we all belong. Anybody else? Okay, who's on Facebook? I would really like you to join a group. It's called OK Changing Stations Advocate for Matt. A, it's a page, and then you're going to see a group, Advocates for Max's Law. If you, if you find this conversation interesting, I hope that you'll join that group. I do not like social media. If you find me on Instagram, I'm there, but I only check it just to maybe see the wiener dog stuff he sends me, <laughs> okay? But and you, you feel free to, to friend me, too. And I would invite you to read a few of the posts I've put on there. It might disgust you, and it might make you, who's, who is, is everyone in this room a registered voter? Okay. Representation matters. And you will see, if you follow me just a minute on there, you might find that this conversation is headed to the Attorney General's office. Okay, that's all I got to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tulsa. <laughs> One thing I want to commend you on, and you guys, I want you guys to think about this too, is this is about changing spaces. Like, where, where are we going to have restroom needs? That's not the only need out there. So this is an example of how far advocacy can reach and with all the steps that we need.